So here it is. I'm going to be talking about braids, cables, and cells, and I'll tell you what aspect of those words that actually mean. And I'm going to be talking about art and craft and mathematics and computer science. So let's start with the art. So I'm going to be talking about a particular design element uh, which is often called knotwork, sometimes it's called Celtic knotwork, because it's often associated with uh, medieval uh, Irish and uh, uh, similar traditions where, uh, actually maybe I will, yeah, all right. Um, where you have this idea of, of depictions of strands going under and over each other. Um, while, I, like I said, this is often associated with medieval Ireland, it actually goes back much earlier. Here's a Roman mosaic, and uh, I've seen, you know, Egyptian and, and things that, that, that looks similar. And, and probably as long as people have been drawing things, they've been doodling strands that go under and over each other. They're still doing it today. Mm -hmm couple of modern examples that I just sort of pulled off the web. Um, all right. So um, this, uh, uh, personally, uh, the study of this was inspired by, by knitting patterns. Um, this same sort of, of under and over design in knitting is known as a cable. Um, my wife, Lana, there may be able to tell you why. I actually don't know why, to be perfectly honest. Um, but uh, knitters often do these, th and, and it's not done by actually making strands and tacking them down to the fabric, by the way. It's a little bit of an illusion. Um, there really is a 3D effect, but it's not, it's not actually things smacking down right on top of each other, but uh, it looks like it is. Uh, just similar to the way you draw things, it looks like things are passing over and under each other. Um, you can also do it if you don't knit. I don't knit, but I do crochet. Theoretically, you can do it in crochet, although it's harder. I've tried it and, mm -hmm. and don't come out anything like that nice. Um, you can do a similar effect, uh, even more uh, of a trompe and less of, a, of an actual strands going over and under, but and you get this similar idea. Actually, for this particular design, you really maybe see it even better in the, the pattern. This is the pattern that somebody might be following as opposed to the actual. But you can sort of see that, it, that this one is coming along and it goes under and then over and under. It gives the impression anyway. So this is a, a, a common design motif in several sorts of, of art and craft. <laughs> Oh, and of course, there's actual weaving where you really do take either uh, uh, threads of, of fabric, or in this case, this is, I guess, a reed basket uh, in a traditional Native American pattern, and you actually do pass things over and under each other. So that's that's another example. This um, study of things like this mathematically, from a mathematical point of view, um, the earliest I've been able to trace it back is is uh, Vandermond. Um, uh, the probably maybe known from the Vandermond determinant, um, only wrote, it turns out, four mathematical papers. Uh, one of them started knot theory, topology, and graph theory. Well, maybe not quite started, but a really early paper in all three of those things. Um, here's an example of, of maybe what today we would call knot theory from that paper. Gauss was interested in looking at braids. He tried to work out this notation where complex numbers represented the crossings and tried to, to use the, the imaginary part to identify uh, how many times it had gone under or over another strand. Never quite got it to his satisfaction like many things Gauss did and therefore never got around publishing it like many things Gauss did. But after his, uh, his death, they found this picture in his, in his notebooks. Um, today, uh, braids are studied from, by topologists and group theorists. Um, topologists, uh, because, uh, well, you know, topology is the study of things that are the same if you sort of pull and push and stretch them around, but you don't break them. So you can sort of see how um, this strand here was pulled under this strand there, and then over that strand there, and this strand there was pulled over a little bit there. And topologically speaking, these two braids are the same. 
and so those are considered the same. Um, when you're studying braids, the other thing you're not allowed to do is loop a strand over the top and behind another strand. So you can either just sort of think of the universe as ending here, or maybe think of it as extending infinitely off, however you prefer. Um, I am going to be, and, and in fact, you'll see in these diagrams, nothing even loops back on itself. All right? And uh, from a knitting point of view, that, that, that makes sense, um, because, well, I don't know if you might hold up your knitting for people to see. I just want to see what it looks like when you've got a needle and things dangling from it. I'm sure you've seen that before. But the idea is you're basically building it up row by row from the bottom to the top. And so it, you don't usually turn around and start knitting in the other direction from the top to the bottom. Uh, likewise, I'm going to be thinking about strands moving from bottom to top, although if you ask a topologist, they might disagree. Um, but I said this is also studied by group theorists. Uh, group theorists like to think about taking uh, braids. If you know anything about group theory, or even if you don't, the idea is just that you have a rule that says you combine two things and you get a third thing. Well, you can combine two braids by stacking them on top of each other. So if you think of stacking this one on top of that one, then you get a braid which starts here, and it goes up for a while, and then it goes under the next braid over. It goes up and goes under. All right? And this one is going up there, and then straight, and this one is just going straight. This one. So you can see that, that with a little bit of topological pulling and pushing around, this braid is just the same as those two stacked on each other. Sometimes you get um, simplifications. If, uh, if one had gone over this way and then over the other way in the other braid, then it would just pull out straight. Uh, so you could get two braids that uh, multiply the identity braid. You have inverse braids. Um, it's related to the symmetric group, which also, you know, you can think of this as interchanging these two, and this is interchanging these two, except if you, if you interchange two things and then you interchange them in the same direction again, they don't cancel out. It matters what direction you're switching things around in, whereas uh, it, to cancel out, you have to switch it back in the opposite direction. So uh, uh, for those of you who uh, uh, really uh, uh, know or remember your algebra, uh, there's a, a homomorphism, a subjective homomorphism from this onto the, onto the uh, um, symmetric group, but uh, with a non-trivial kernel. It doesn't really matter. I'm not actually going to talk about that for the entire rest of the talk. But just in case there are any algebraists who want to feel very special. <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about something else entirely. I'm going to talk about cellular automata, which is actually an idea uh, used mostly by computer scientists. I don't know about mostly. Used a lot by computer scientists, although it's a purely mathematical construct. It's theoretical computer science. It's a very simple model of a computational system. I don't know if I want to call it a computer. It's got a finite number of cells in a regular grid. So you've got this regular grid of cells that extends for a while and then maybe stops. You have a finite, finite number of states. Each cell can be in one of them, just a finite number of states. So maybe this has got a dark gray state and a light gray state and a white state, and that's it. So each cell is in maybe one of three different states. Each cell is a well-defined finite neighborhood and is only affected by cells in its neighborhood. So this is a picture of what's called the von Neumann neighborhood, which means each cell is influenced by the cell directly north, south, east, and west of it, but not by the ones diagonally and not by the ones more than one away. But you can pick that neighborhood any way you want. You can pick it so it includes the diagonals. You can pick it so that it goes two away instead of one away. You can pick it so that it goes one away, you know, or the, two away in some directions and one way, whatever you want to pick. As long as it's the same for every cell, um, as long as, it, okay, as long as it's the same for every cell. Um, time is considered to move in discrete steps, and you have an update rule that says that at each time you look at the neighborhood of a cell and use the states in the neighborhood to determine the next state that that cell is going to be in, and every cell is going to use exactly the same rule to do that. So it's a very simple computational model, but the interaction of maybe a large number of these things can get you interesting results. So that's the, the theory of it. 
So an example, and I hear we've got a couple of experts on this in the audience. So you guys can tell me if I say anything wrong. No, okay, all right. Tell me if I'm doing anything wrong. Um, this was invented by a mathematician named John Conway. Supposedly, this was first played on a tile floor in a bathroom. Had lots of nice little squares to put markers on. The grid is two-dimensional and square. You don't even have to have a square grid, although it's most common. You could have a hexagonal or a triangle. This one, the game of life, is, is played on a square grid. Um, the cells are in two different states, which are usually called live and dead, although unoccupied and, and live might be, might be more uh, accurate. Um, the neighborhood is uh, the eight cells, so horizontal, vertical, or diagonal. So all, all eight of those are going to influence the center cell. Um, and the rule is that if you have a live cell, and it has two or three live neighbors. So this cell has two live neighbors, that cell is three, that cell is three. Those cells are gonna stay live. Um, if you have a live cell with uh, fewer than two live neighbors, it dies of loneliness. <laughs> very, very sad. And if you have one with more than three live neighbors, it dies of overcrowding. Um, on the other hand, and, and those cells just disappear, there aren't any dead bodies floating around to, to, to really get you down. So that's good. Um, a dead cell that has exactly three live neighbors, so these two cells have exactly three live neighbors, so I said dead, maybe you should really think of as unoccupied, um, becomes a live cell. So three parents give birth to a new cell. I don't think this was inspired by any particular biological model. I think that uh, they just experimented with the rules for a while until, until they got something interesting. Um, any other dead cell, if it's not surrounded by exactly three live neighbors, so this one has two, that one has four, uh, those cells just stay dead or stay unoccupied. Seems like a very simple sort of thing, but it actually creates some very interesting um, and complex patterns. So this one is a pulsar. If you start like this, it evolves like that and gets back to where it starts after a couple. Imagine some really interesting animations. So this one just cycles, but there are some that spit off projectiles in directions. There are some that just truck across the, across the I want to say screen, even if you're done with the computer animation, across the board, I guess we should maybe say, if it's a game. Um, so lots of really interesting behavior uh, can be uh, done like this. So that's a, a, one of the really earliest examples of a cellular automata. Um, there's another well-known class of, of cellular automata. They're called elementary cellular automata because these are about as simple as you can get. These are even simpler than the game of life. Um, they were popularized by Stephen Wolfram, who is the, the guy in, uh, who invented Mathematica, and he wrote this book, The New Kind of Science, about um, how he thought that every, every piece of science and mathematics should be, should be modeled with cellular automata. And that should really be the new way of doing science. Uh, that, that seems a little bit uh, extreme to me, but uh, um, you can do lots of interesting things, even just with these simple ones where you have a one-dimensional grid. So instead of a square, it's just a line of cells. Uh, two states, white and black, or sometimes zero and one. So sometimes I'll say zero and one when I really mean white and black. The neighborhood is just three cells, the cell you're talking about, and one cell on each side. All right. So how do you specify a rule? Well, you've got three cells in the neighborhood. Each one can be in one of two states. So how many different possible neighborhoods have we got? Three cells, each of which is in one of two states. Eight. Eight, right? Two to the third. OK. So for each of those two to the third possible neighborhoods, you have to decide, is the center cell going to be zero or one, white or black? Right? So in this case, someone has sort of arbitrarily decided that if there are three black, it's going to be white, other than zero. In this case, it's going to be white, zero, zero, one, 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 zero. Okay, so if that completely determines a rule, next question, a little bit of a quiz. I don't want you to just sit there falling asleep on me. How many rules are there? I asked this, by the way, at a... Uh, Illinois MAA section meeting last week, and, and um, 
and none of the professors were getting it right. I think the undergrads did better. <laughs> And yeah, get, now that I've said that, does anybody actually want to try it? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got eight different possibilities for the neighborhood. In each case, you have to decide whether it's going to be a white or a black. So. Well, so what I'm, we're trying to work out the details of my I was thinking about it as a binary number. So you can think about it as an 8-bit binary number, in which case, how many are there? 64. No. More than 64. No, 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 no. 256. 256. Yeah. 256. 256. Um, and this one, and, and Stephen Wolfram just decided to, to, to take that 00111110 and make a binary number out of it. And so this is rule 30, because that's the binary number for 30. So that just gave him a nice way of numbering all of those rules from 0 to 255. Uh, rule 90 is a, an inter and he picked out some of the most interesting of those rules. So rule 90 is a nice interesting rule. Um, now, uh, Stephen Wolfram is obviously not a knitter um, because uh, time in his diagrams is starting at the top and progressing down to the bottom. So I'm going, to, I'm going to reverse that in a bit, but I did copy this from one of his diagrams, which was posted on Math World. So if you start out with just a single black square, then the next time step it evolves like that, like that, and starts developing out the Sierpinski triangle fractal and the, the longer you let it run, if you have an infinitely wide board, uh, the longer you let it run, the, the more of the triangle fractal you get. This is also a really nice rule because it's an additive rule, which means um, a couple of things. But uh, if you take one of these patterns, and you smack another pattern that's made by a different cell, you know, smack it down somewhere else, and then say white plus white is white, and black plus black is white. It's a one, zero plus zero is, is zero, and zero plus one is one, and one plus one is zero, addition modulo two, or XOR if there are any uh, people who prefer computer notation. Um, you get the pattern that you would get if you just started out with two black squares to begin with. So it's really, um, convenient to be able to predict what's going on because you can build larger patterns out of smaller ones just by using this addition. That makes it theoretically very nice to work with. Um, however, uh, Wolfram was particularly interested in, in much more complicated behavior, something that appeared to be chaotic or, or pseudo-random or something like that. Um, so he was looking at a different rule. Well, he was looking at this, this rule 30. Actually, here it is again. So, and he was looking at what happens if you get rule 30, and he noticed that it's, it, it has a, a, well, like I said, it kind of seems like it behaves chaotically, although it's hard to define what chaotic actually means for a discrete system, and I'm not going to try. But uh, it's got you know, pattern going down this way, and kind of a pattern going down that way. And somewhere in the middle, it transitions to something where it becomes much harder to predict what's going on. Um, he didn't get very far in proving this, uh, to be perfectly honest. He conjectured, he couldn't even quite prove this conjecture that if you draw a line right down the center, it never repeats. All right. Um, and I mean, well, rule 90 never repeats either, per se, but it's very predictable. And this is, is not very predictable. Not clear what's going on there exactly. Um, and uh, so one of his, I'm not sure, students, protégés, um, proved uh, at least that at most one cell is periodic. So almost all of them, maybe none of them, but, but oops, almost all of these produce aperiodic sequences. And, uh, and also any two adjacent cells definitely produce something aperiodic, which I guess is a simple corollary of A. Um, and so uh, Wolfram was confident enough that this was an unpredictable sequence that he used it as a pseudo-random number generator. But you remember, you start with a very simple rule and just one square, and you're getting something very complex coming out of it. So another example of that is in rule 110, 
which was proved to be computationally universal in the sense that it can be used to simulate any Turing machine. If you don't know what a Turing machine is, again, it's one, another one of these mathematical abstractions of a computer, but this is a very rich one. It is, it is wild, widely, maybe wildly also, it's widely <laughs> believed that anything that you can compute by any algorithm you can compute with a Turing machine, um, whether this is actually provable or not depends on how you want to define an algorithm. Some people just kind of define an algorithm by anything you can compute by, by a Turing machine. So in, which case in which case it's proved, I guess. Um, but people think, many people think that computation is completely captured by the idea of a Turing machine. And therefore, computation is completely captured by one particular cellular automaton, rule 110. Um, and if there are any complexity geeks in the audience, uh, it can be done uh, in polynomial, with only polynomial expansion, which is important for people who feel that that's important. <laughs> <laughs> On the um, single cell, rule 110 doesn't do anything especially interesting um, because if you just have a one bit input, you can't do anything especially interesting with it. Um, but the idea is that you can use rule 110 to simulate a cyclic tag system. I'll explain what that is in a bit. And then you can show that any Turing machine can be simulated by a cyclic tag system. Um, I think that the easiest thing to do, uh, uh, which I'm not going to do, is to, to show that a cyclic tag system can simulate a non-cyclic, or not necessarily cyclic tag system. Once I tell you what a cyclic tag system is, though, I think that you'll believe that that, that can, can simulate a Turing machine. The interesting part is that 110 can simulate a cyclic tag system. A cyclic tag system has a data string and a list of rules, which is really just a computer program, except here's where the, the, the cyclic part comes in. It's a computer program that just consists of one big loop. That's all it is. So it's a fairly restricted computer program. And there's only one sort of operation, but it, it has a branch in it, so at least you can do something with it. If the first data symbol in your string is a 1, then you tack your rule onto the end of your string. If the first data symbol is a 0, then you don't do anything, and then you delete the first data symbol and repeat. So, if you have these three production rules, so you just go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, and so on, and you start with this data string, then you look and say, oh, OK, the first thing in the data string is a 1, so I'm going to stick this rule onto the end and delete the 1. OK, got a 1 still. Stick the next rule onto the end and delete the 1. And now I've got a 0, so don't put anything on the end, delete the 0. Don't put anything on the end, delete the 0. Well, now you're, you're, you're back to this 0, 0, 0 rule, and you've got a 1, and you put the zeros on the end. And now you're back here, but you've got a 0, so you don't use it. And you can see that as it goes on, it's going to be doing different things with the same rules depending on whether it's got zeros or ones in front. So I hope you can believe that you could maybe write a computer program in this way. It would be difficult, but, but uh, it has branches, it has loops, and so it has the basic things that you need. Now here's how you simulate that with the cellular automata. You need a representation of the data string, and that's these vertical lines here. I think that the gray thing is a 1, and the black things are zeros. I'm not positive about that. Might be the other way around. Um, and uh, you need the production rules. So that would be these things coming along this way. And then you need clock pulses, which come along that way. All right. So each interaction the clock pulse is a time step, so at each time step, you're going to have the data string hitting some production rules, and it's going to chug along a bit, and then it's going to rewrite its thing and then move along to the next time step. I'm not going to go through all the gory details, but uh, this is, I think, one time, actually, it's not even a whole time step. The, 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 the clock pulses aren't even on here. This is all between two clock pulses. But you can see some uh, data coming here, hitting some representation rules and doing some interesting things. And some different data string is coming out the other side. So here's a data string that comes out the other side. And here's one that doesn't. So I guess that's all maybe a 1 and a 1 changing into a 0. And I don't remember exactly. But, 
but it's it's a it, there's a lot of expansion it has to you need a very large piece of things in order to to simulate each clock step but it is according to that theorem only polynomial so for a computer scientist or a theoretical computer scientist or a mathematician that's good enough wouldn't want to do it in an actual practice maybe all right so that's cellular automata and please feel free to interrupt with any questions as, as we go along if you, if you have any so how did I get started on combining these two things, these two ideas of braids or knots and these cellular automata? Well, two things happen, and uh, I was trying to reconstruct, I'm not absolutely sure what order they happen in anymore. But um, one is that I was talking to a fellow named Jake Wildstrom, who's a mathematician who likes to crochet sort of pins and triangle fractals like this one here. And he said somebody had asked him to write up a pattern for crocheters of, of this. Um, and he was complaining to me that you shouldn't really need a pattern um, because after all, it's just produced by the simple rule. If you have a raised bit, then you make an unraised bit. And if you have an, uh, you know, two unraised bits, then you make, you know, if you have two raised bits, you make an unraised bit. And if you have one raised bit, you make a raised bit. Um, I agreed that, that, that you really shouldn't have to write out the whole pattern for that, but that probably people who crochet are more likely to want the whole pattern spelled out and not just that simple production rule, but I stored that in the back of my head somewhere. And the other thing is that I was uh, looking at something that Lana was knitting with, with cables on it, and I noticed that she was doing it without a pattern, and it was a fairly long and intricate, much, much more intricate than this one here, um, a fairly long and intricate uh, uh, pattern, and she uh, appeared to have it memorized, and I remarked on that, and she said, well, you don't really have to memorize the whole thing, because there's a lot of parts where you just remember that if you're going this way, you do that, and if you're going that way, you do this, and if you're crossing, then you do that. And so I sort of stashed that away in my head, and I got to thinking, you know, that sounds like the same thing we were talking about here, and this I know is all about cellular automata, so maybe these braid uh, uh, cable patterns can be done with cellular automata also. And I did a little bit of research, found that somebody had had, had this idea before. This idea wasn't original to me. Uh, a woman named Debbie New had written a chapter of one of her books where she explained about this. Um, but she only really explained how to do things like this pattern, where basically they all go straight, except sometimes they cross. And the cellular automata rule just determined cross or no cross. Didn't determine which one crossed which direction, or, or whether it went off in some other, you know, just cross or no cross. So I said, well, okay, that's a start, but I think we could probably work more into it than that. So in my model, each cell is storing four bits of information, which I, I won't ask you to answer this one. Ordinarily, that would be 16 different states, but we're going to sometimes ignore some of the bits of information. So the first two bits of information are going to say, is there a left strand or not? Yes, no, yes, no. Is there a right strand or not? No, no, yes, yes. OK, that's easy. If there are strands, are they straight or slanted? That's another bit of information. Except sometimes, right, if there are no strands, it doesn't matter whether they're straight or slanted. So in that case, we're going to ignore that bit of information. But otherwise, it could be straight or slanted, straight or slanted. Uh, but then, if you have two strands and they're slanted, well, then you can think about, do they cross this way or do they cross that way? And so in that one situation, you're going to want one more bit of information telling you where the crossing is going. So there's eight different types of cells, but there's, there's four bits of information, some of which are ignored in some situations. What about the neighborhood? Um, it seemed uh, convenient to uh, have these be uh, a brick wall neighborhood. Uh, again, like knitting patterns, time is moving from bottom to top here. And each cell is going to be influenced by these standard cells below left and below right. Except, I mean, in a sense, these aren't below. In a sense, these are before. Um, just remember, the second dimension is the same as the time dimension. So, um, so if you have eight cells, theoretically, um, and two neighborhoods, theoretically, uh, there could be eight times eight different types of neighborhoods. So you could have 64. And theoretically, each of those could have eight different uh, results. 
and that would be a really, really, really large rule set. So I decided to put some more conditions, uh, both to make it uh, a little better physical model and also to uh, uh, make it a little more tractable. So the first two parts, uh, I, I broke down the rule system into four simpler rule systems. And the first two parts just say strands continue. They don't suddenly disappear. Uh, they don't suddenly split into two. They don't suddenly appear out of nowhere. Um, in knitting, you can sometimes break these rules, but I thought just for starters, let's set out these rules. So uh, if there are no, no strands, then there continue to be no strands. If there's a strand on the right below and on the left below, then there are two strands above. If there's a strand on the right below, it becomes a strand on the left above because the brick wall staggering and so on. Doesn't matter for these purposes whether they're straight like this or slanted like that. This is just saying that strands continue, they don't break or, or, or appear out of nowhere or, or loop around back on themselves or anything else like that. Third CA, a little more interesting, controls whether the strands are upright or diagonal. Right? And so I decided that maybe the important question was um, just whether the strands below were upright or diagonal or missing decided to, have a, to make it a little more interesting to have a separate category for missing. So the strand on the left here could be, could be uh, diagonal slanted, it could be missing, it could be upright, and likewise the one on the right could be diagonal, could be missing, it could be upright. Um, so again, that gives me, well, that gives me nine possibilities. I put the middle one in for symmetry, although if there are no strands, then there are no strands, and it doesn't matter whether they're upright or not, but just for symmetry, I left it there. Um, and uh, so the zero says that a strand is going to be straight up here, and the one says that it's going to be slanted. And if they're slanted, they might cross. But this one doesn't affect the crossing at all. Crossing is controlled by another one. So in this case, I decide whether the cell below is a cross uh, with uh, um, left over right or just a single strand or a cross with right over left. Um, and, uh, oh, I meant to add this. Do I have another? No, I don't have another. Um, I decided that anything uncrossed, regardless of whether it was one strand or two strands, as long as it didn't cross, it was going to be in this, this row here. So that gives a little bit of interaction between the two. Because something which, if it's diagonal, it's crossing, and would therefore be in one of these. If it's not diagonal, it's not crossing, despite the fact that there's still two strands there, and so it might be in this row here. It gives a little bit of added interaction, provides a little bit more interest. OK. Then I had to decide, I've got the neighborhood. Um, I've got the, uh, uh, the types of, of cells. I glossed a little bit over the fact I said there was a finite grid, um, but then I didn't tell you what happened at the end of the grid. And actually, um, Conway, um, I don't know what John Conway originally did in the game of life. Um, Stephen Wolfram just decided to make the grid infinite so that he didn't have to worry about the edges. Um, you could have a special kind of state for edge cells that things maybe got absorbed into or bounced off of. Um, if you're knitting a sweater, you often see cables on that sweater. Can you stand up? <laughs> <laughs> you might see, does the cable come kind of to your arm around to the back, or does it it'll get absorbed in the side <laughs> soon? You maybe you haven't even looked to see. Yes, yes, right, that one seems okay. okay. That would maybe another common thing to do is to have the cable sort of absorbed into the side seam when you get to the side seam, uh, um, or maybe bounce off the side seam. But then you have to decide exactly how the bounce works. Um, so I took the easy way out and just made the grid so that it just wrapped around. The cellular automata people call this periodic boundary conditions, although what they really should say is there are no boundary conditions because there's no boundary. <laughs> um, but that's what they call it. And that seemed to be the easiest thing. So I'm going to stick to uh, socks and hats and fairly simple sweaters uh, for these categories. So, things that are, are symmetrical. All right. But I can get some, some, some very nice patterns. I can produce patterns like the Sierpinski triangle fractal. This is a bit of a cheat, remember, because there aren't really two triangles here. There should be. But in fact, these are the two halves of the same triangle because it's, it's wrapping around. Um, but of course, if I just made it larger, I could get as many triangles as I wanted. I just have to decide how many I want to make sure it's that large. 
Um, weaving patterns, so a very uh, typical, oh, so, so this is rule 68 uh, for the thing that determines whether it crosses or, or whether it slants or doesn't slant. Um, and which I call the turning rule sometimes, and rule zero for the crossing rule, which just says all the crossings go the same direction. Right, so very simple, but it can reproduce some of these fractal patterns. Um, this, uh, these, in this case, um, nothing ever turns. It just keeps going in the same direction that it's going. So the turning rule isn't active, but the crossing rules decide when it's crossing, which one is crossing over the other. So this is a nice classic basket weave pattern. Uh, this is maybe not something that you would want to weave a basket out of, um, but it's a graphic design element, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, this is a traditional three-strand braid, uh, when you, back when you were at summer camp and you were weaving lanyards or whatever, friendship bracelets, I don't know. Um, the, the, just a very standard three-strand braid, uh, four-strand braid, uh, very, very common. Um, there they are in, in actual. There they are in my uh, model with uh, with uh, uh, This is the same uh, two sets of rules actually. The only difference between these is that if you start with this, you get a three strand braid. If you start that, you get a four strand braid. Um, same rules. Start with as you know wide a pattern as you want, and that's how wide the braid is. So, um, again, uh, giving the idea that, that we're actually capturing something interesting with these rules. That this is the braid rule, the traditional braid rule or rules, crossing rule and turning rule. Um, I was looking for pictures online of these different braids. Has anybody seen this braid before? I've never seen this braid before, though some people have. Um, it uh, uh, has sort of a, a large jump where you go over a couple of, th I guess you go over three strands and back under one, and then under three, and then over three, and then under three. So that, uh, when you actually pull it tight, gives you a three-dimensional, very round sort of braid because these long loops um, pull up into the, this one I guess pulls up into the front and the next one would pull it back into the back. Um, so that's, that's nice and I was uh, uh, satisfied to see that I could model that with my rules. If you had various other sorts of interesting, I hope interesting and decorative cable patterns, these are starting to look more like something than you might actually uh, mint. And in fact, Lana liked the one on the left. So, uh oh, that's okay. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. Right. So she did it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's pretty good. The, the lighting is, is pretty good to show show off the, the relief here, so you can see that. Uh, uh, this is um, passing over and under and over again. We've been doing that for a while. Um, so there, there are some, some cable patterns there. Technically, only one of those socks was Rule 47. The other one is the mirror image. And <laughs> every so often, Lon asks me if I've uh, remember to, to, to work out what rule produces the mirror image, and I still haven't remembered to sit down and work it out. Uh, you, you can, it's like you have to, you have to flip all the bits and then flip the high end with the low end or something like that. It's, it's a, I worked it out once and then I immediately forgot. <laughs> Same socks there. All right. So what do we know from a uh, from, um, uh, point of view of, of theorems about this? Um, well, um, if you don't have to worry about missing strands and you're only using a crossing or a turning and not the other one, uh, then basically this is an elementary cellular automata where you ignore the middle cell of the neighborhood. So um, this is exactly the same as Wolfram's Rule 90, um, with with no you know all the crossings the same direction, and just determining whether you cross or whether you turn, make one of them white and one of them black, and you'll get exactly the same pattern for exactly the same reason. Um, so okay, that's something we know, I guess. <laughs> Um, somebody asked me once about uh, the chaotic or chaotic-like aperiodic behavior. 
Uh, well, um, the, since the width here is finite, there technically isn't any, well, it's not technically, there isn't any aperiodic behavior. Um, since there's only a finite num number of states the system total can be in, eventually it has to repeat. But you could ask how long that repeat is. Um, so, first thing I worked out was um, just not you know, having the weaving patterns where nothing ever turns, everything just goes straight, only the crossing rule is active. Um, for a given width m, I worked out how long a repeat can possibly be. So uh, the idea here is that um, there's a natural repeat if m is the width. There's a natural repeat of 2m after which things sort of potentially get back to where they started. If you've got a missing crossing strand here, the missing crossing strand rotates through and after 2m it gets back to where it started. And so that's a natural sort of repeat. Then you just, for the ones that do cross, which one is on top is all you have to worry about since nothing is turning. Um, and I've tr I tried to make uh, uh, the crossings in one dimension, direction red and in the other direction blue. I don't know if you can make that out there. If there are all m strands present, all m crossings, then you simply say, OK, there's two to the m possible arrangements of the crossings. Um, but then the 2m sort of gets lost because there isn't that missing strand percolating through. There is a shift of, you know, from, from this stagger to that stagger. So the maximum repeat is the least common multiple of something that goes up to 2 to the m and something that goes up to 2. Okay. Um, on the other hand, there's only m minus 1 crossings. If you leave one out, then there's only 2 to the m minus 1 possible arrangements but 2m different shifts. So now you've got the LCM of something less than or equal to the m minus 1 and something uh, less than or equal to 2m. And uh, you can work, if there are fewer crossings than that, it has to be even, even smaller. You can work it out fairly easily. Um, and then you put that together, and you've got about m times 2m, but you work out the things where the least common multiple doesn't really get you anything, and, and this is as long as the repeat can be. Um, except for trivial m's, I haven't gotten anywhere near that. I'm not, I don't, I suspect that you can't get very close to that really in practice. Um, but I haven't proved it. Um, if you have a given width, um, how long a repeat can you find if you look at all the possible rules and all the possible starting positions? Well, for a given width, you can find one if m is greater than or equal to 2k, you can find one that's at least the LCM of 2 to the k plus 1 and 2m. Uh, rows long. And basically, I just found it. I did a little bit of a search, and after a while, I realized that crossing rule 100 is an additive rule. Remember, I talked about how additive rules were easy to analyze theoretically. And uh, so I worked out that uh, um, for that rule, uh, you've got a nice long repeat of 2 to the k plus 1 just in the crossing pattern. What's really going on here, I finally figured out after looking at a lot of examples, is that what you've really got is you've really got another one of these elementary cellular automata trucking along but sort of slanted that way, and, but with a, 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 a boundary there. So this is actually, you can look at this as an elementary cellular automata that doesn't wrap around. And so eventually I found something very like this result in the literature, which said that the repeat for the pattern that goes diagonally is at most 2 to the k plus 1. Uh, it is 2 to the k plus 1, excuse me, if m is larger than 2 to the k, and you work out the, 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 the equals part separately. And then you have also this cyclic shift, which gives you the 2m, and then you've got the else. There you go. Um, I thought for some time that this was the best you could do. It's not. Um, for m up to 5, I uh, ran maple simulations, because maple is what I had handy. And then I ran out of patience and decided that that was probably good enough. But then again, I was reading some of these results on an elementary cellular automata, and I realized that for the elementary cellular automata with periodic boundary condition, and certain prime numbers and additive rules, you can get a really long repeat. Not 
quite as long as my bound here. But for certain cases, you do get a nice long repeat. And for m equals 23, you actually get longer than this. My current guess is that additive rules and either m or m minus 1 crossings are going to give you the longest repeats. Um, but I haven't proved that, and I haven't shown which situations it's going to be m and which situations it's going to be m minus 1. It's a lot of work left to do. If anybody wants a project, either for themselves or for some students interested in cellular automata, um, there's a lot of great stuff there. And this is just if you only worry about crossings and things don't turn. I've got even less if things do turn. If there's only one or two, well, if there's only one strand, you don't have to worry about crossings at all, so that's easy. Um, if there's two strands, then you don't have to worry very much about crossings. And uh, again, it's not too hard just to work out that the maximum repeat, there's the natural 2m shift, and then there's, you can make this, do this little hop here, which gives you another factor of 2m plus 1, and the LCM of 2m and 2m plus 1, of course, is that those relative prime. So, so you can tell what's doing with uh, only one or two strands, but that's you know, not especially interesting. More than that, you really don't know. Um, and like I, I, I mentioned before, if both rules are active, I set it up so you have two elementary cellular automata going, but one of them sometimes interferes with the other. In the case where they don't cross, then it, then it, it, it bleeds from one into the other. And so, so I think that there's a really nice, probably accessible structure there that I have not uh, just uh, really started working on yet. Lots more situations for the length of the maximum repeat to work on. Um, computational complexity. So the maximum repeat stuff is sort of related to the aperiodic behavior. This is related to the uni computational universality of rule 110. Again, on a finite grade, you can't get true computational universality. But you can say, how hard is it to answer a question like, is this cell eventually going to be in this state? Um, it might be, uh, again, if there are any complexity geeks, it might be as hard as p-space completeness to, to figure that out, but I don't know if it is or not. Um, different edge conditions. I really did at some point want to go back to the braid groups and say, which elements of braid groups can I actually represent with these things? Um, again, because of the, the finite limitation, there's a limit to, it can't be all of them, but which ones? Uh, reversibility, there's an idea of reversibility of cellular automata rules, which rules can you go backwards and uniquely trace back through a pattern given an ending condition? I don't know. And then lots of people have suggested, well, what if it does bounce around and turn back on itself? You need a two-dimensional grid to represent that, and time would be a third dimension. You could represent maybe by color or by some sculptural um, representation in three dimensions, which would be really cool, but I don't know what to do with it yet. So lots of future work to do. Well, thanks very much. And thanks a lot to my wife for lots of encouragement. <laughs> Any questions for our speaker? I'm just wondering if you have, uh, you mentioned some rules are added and then some must not be. Have those been delineated? Is that an easy question to ask or not? Um, so uh, for the elementary, so, so, so for the, the most elementary situation, um, you uh, ignore the one in the middle like I am because it's a brick wall and then you just, then there are only 16 really different rules and it's, it's fairly easy to delineate them. For all 256 elementary rules, I mean, yeah, you can say which ones are, most of them are not additive. Um, and you can say a little bit about how nonlinear they are. Um, I have found there seem to be special cases where people have, you know, people have studied threshold rules a lot, where the more cells you have, the more likely it is to turn the, the next one on. The more cells that are, that are ones make, make more likely to have the next ones be ones. Um, and, and, yeah, several other specific types of rules have been studied. Um, Wolfram started a grand program to categorize the complete behavior of all 256 rules, but that's far from being.
But it, uh, what about the original problem of kind of representing knitting structures with the rules? And are the rules helpful to a knitter? Like, can you knit by rule versus by pattern? When That's you had when you had rule forty seven, did you uh, did you actually knit those socks by? Uh, you actually knit those socks from a real pattern, didn't you? Uh, no, I knit them. I knit them from your diagram that you had generated, but I had to figure out the specifics for how I was going to interpret each of the cells in knitting. And after I had knitted for, a, I, I didn't stare at the rule, memorize the rule, what was going to happen. But after knitting for a bit, I could say, yeah, okay, well, whenever this one moves this way, then it's going to go straight first. So I was using the rule, but I didn't start that way. I think the answer is some of each. I could have learned the rule first and then surprised myself. <laughs> um, then so far, I think the most inter the, 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 the thing about this that would be most interesting to an inner, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that I think it's a really uh, neat way of generating patterns that, that, that uh, somebody might not have thought of. You know, I, I don't know if anybody would have ever sat down and designed one of these. This one maybe, I don't know if anybody would ever sit down and visit. It has a certain uh, baroqueness to it that, that doesn't spring easily to the mind, but is, is still appealing, I think. Any other questions? All right, thank you again.